<clears throat> All right, we are game 2005, uh, game physics here at George Brown. Uh, and this is the last lecture uh, for this semester anyway. Um, so what I wanted to cover with you today uh, as a final thing was collision response. Uh, there are different ways of um, talking about collision response. Um, you know, there's, there's different names around it, but I'm, I'm calling it collision response. People call it um, other things. So we have, uh, there's a collision resolution. So there's two parts, right? There's detection. So I've detected a collision and then what's going to happen? Right. Sometimes it's as simple as uh, in a 2D environment that you do a pickup, you make a sound, uh, you blow things up, you know, whatever. You get points with your collision resolution. It's that simple. Like there's nothing else to be done. Um, sometimes we use collision resolution uh, as in I have an object and I move it on top of another object and then it, it causes a puzzle to be completed or something else. But the more difficult uh, collision resolution or response is the one that's involved with physics, which we've been talking about all semester, right? Um, this long, unending semester. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we're talking about today. So there's a couple things that, that we can go into, and there's a couple of that I've left out. I'm going to briefly talk about bouncing off horizontal or vertical walls. How do you do that? Uh, what are the challenges around that? Is it so easy? Um, and uh bouncing off incline walls when things aren't exactly uh you know kind of x and y um they're kind of skewed a little bit now it says collision between particles in 1d and it's that's really like a 2d collision that's really what it is um and collision of particles in 2d is a 2d collision kind of a 2d collision but a, a not a head-on collision not like center to center that kind of collision but a, 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 a collision that's just slightly off center which can be more complex and there's cases within each of these things, okay, that I want to talk about briefly. Um, we talk about a wall, we talk about this flat surface, this idea that it's fixed, it's uh, in a, uh, some kind of physics engine, we would say that it's a fixed uh, body, that's what it is, it's a static body, um, it's not a dynamic body that we have in other physics engines that we've been using before, uh, or in games, um, and they're not going to move around, so there's some um, strategies around how we do collision response in, the, in that case. One of the strategies can be as simple as, hey, I know there's a wall there. If my bullet or player or whatever goes beyond this certain uh, X and Y coordinate, well, then just get rid of the bullet or player or stop the player at a certain point. And that's, that's perfectly fine if that's what you want to do. I think that's a valid response. Uh, but when you want to bounce something around, like let's say if, if you're hitting a barrier, not just a wall that's a border around your screen, but a barrier, and you want to have some kind of, you know, natural movement that we've been talking about all semester, where you have a, uh, some kind of missile, a projectile, a particle, something, a player that hits a wall with some kind of force or speed, and you want it to bounce off, then there's a couple of ways we can do that. Um, and then um, that's what we're going to start talking about right away. All right, so bouncing off horizontal or vertical walls, that's the simplest case because they're in line with the screen coordinates, right? They're horizontal or vertical, horizontal, vertical. Uh, so it's kind of easy to fix that, you know, figure that out. So two types of collisions uh, that we didn't have a chance to cover in physics this semester is inelastic and elastic, uh, you know, collisions. And there's two, there's kind of a perfectly elastic uh, collision that we're gonna be talking about here. So what does perfectly elastic mean or inelastic? Perfectly elastic, no energy loss. So it, it basically all the momentum, all the energy you're transferring into that particular collision, when you transfer energy to in a, in a particular location or an object, transfers back. Yeah. So we'll basically drop down to the same, uh, drop down and go back to the same. And it'll keep on going forever. That's not realistic, but sometimes that's the that's the type of bouncing or collision, uh, you know, response you want. An elastic collision, a perfectly elastic collision, like in some kind of pong game. That would be a great example of that, okay? Um, and when we start with elastic collisions, this is good because at least that's the first part of creating a physics engine with some kind of natural movement where you have motion and it bounces, uh, you know, according to the angle of incidence. 
Inelastic collisions is where we do lose energy, and that could be because we have gravity, because we have uh, friction, because we have um, energy that's being absorbed by the wall, and you want to simulate what that is. So example, I throw a ball at a brick wall, my, my ball is going to start you know, being pulled down by gravity, so there's an effect of that that's going to happen, I, I bring that into play. And then I bring into play the effect that when the ball bounces against the wall, there's friction against the wall. The wall is made of, it's not frictionless material. So therefore the wall itself will slow it down when it hits. Um, the ball, the type of ball that I'm using, the type of restitution the ball has, the bounciness, squishiness of the ball. So it hits the, the, uh, the wall and it's less bouncy than other balls. So therefore it doesn't bounce as far. You have a, uh, energy loss. It's being absorbed by the ball and by the wall. That's an elastic type of collisions that we're, we, we can also describe. Um, the idea that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared, we talked about during the physics part portion of our uh, semester. And um, so the idea that when something is perfectly elastic, we talk about just like uh, Corey said, it's, you know, the amount of energy that starts off is the amount of energy that kind of we end up with. So like it says here, just after bouncing, the energy just after bouncing must equal the energy just before bouncing. So we have energy that's being transferred in forms of Newtons uh, as an example, and then that energy, that force is transferred back out. Okay, so perfectly elastic uh, energy transfer. And here's the simplest case. So case one, we have a ball, it's going to have some kind of velocity, it's gonna hit this barrier, and then it's gonna bounce back. And you see that you have a velocity V, and then you're gonna have a negative V coming back the other way, the other direction. So you're literally gonna reverse it. It's that easy when it comes to the code, right? Um, but there's a problem with this, right? Um, it's, we're not just making a collision happen in response. We're detecting the collision, you talked about detection methods last, uh, last week. And now there's a problem because we're doing it on time slice, right? Every time slice, every frame, what's happening is we're saying, okay, am I colliding? Am I colliding? Am I colliding? And we're going to get to this point where we do collide, but it's going to happen when the ball penetrates to some depth the wall or of another object. Okay, so we talked about uh, the other thing that we, we said last week was hey, this would be really bad visually. We have a logical collision. We, we also, we may have a visual artifact here because the wall, the ball is going into the wall partially and then coming back out again. That is bad. So what we need to do is push the ball back out again. So we have to reposition the ball. And that's one of the things we have to do with collision response. Collision response isn't just about um, what to do after, but during collision, right? So what's happening, we're colliding. Okay, but we need to make it look realistic. So therefore we have to reposition the ball back out where it hit the wall at the angle of incidence, right? And once that ball hit the, we reposition it, then we do the collision response. We transfer the energy in the other direction. Yeah. So just like the, um, like you're saying, like if it passes a certain point of like, you know, the X and Z or whatever, then push it back. back that point. Yeah, and it happens in the same frame. So the same frame that is detecting yeah. collision is where we push it back. So there's no visual, visual artifact. Like yeah. Okay. Once you go beyond that, and then you have that weird uh, issue, sometimes what happens is if it's not going fast enough, it might even get stuck. And we don't want that to happen. Better to do it this way than it is to set, um, I can't remember what the example is, but basically it's like, it'll do a check for the next frame. Yeah. And if the next frame, they're past the point. The tunneling, the tunneling idea, yeah. Okay. It's like, checks for that? We can. In, there's the same amount it's the same amount the only thing uh you're doing is you're doing two checks instead of one right so um and if you depending on, on the fidelity that you want the ball to have the then how the dynamic nature of the ball if it's realistic if it's the main character in your game as an example you may want to give it this idea of continuous collision detection where you're looking ahead you're looking ahead you're projecting where it's going to be and then in the case of a wall the wall's not moving or the obstacle typically won't move so you're going to be fine okay in this case this particular case all right so yeah you could do that as well that kind of detection and reposition but repositioning is totally necessary because what's going to happen is if you don't reposition the ball it's going to have this weird thing happen number one two you're going to get the wrong angle of of reflection so you have this 
you know, angle of incidence, just like a wave or a particle beam, you know, you're like in real life, you have some kind of light that, that hits the mirror, let's say, and kind of bounces off and goes somewhere else. An angle of incidence and an angle of reflection. And the angle of reflection is just basically the opposite angle, whatever it is, right? Um, but if you don't do that, what's going to happen is this, this because the ball has penetrated the, the obstacle, you're going to get the wrong angle of reflection and it's going to look wacky. Like, how come it went over there? It's not supposed to, I wouldn't predict it's going to go over there. Our human eye can detect these things. So we want to push it back and then reflect. Um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the things. Uh, the other thing that we want to talk about is you may want to incorporate your energy loss there. So when it's an inelastic collision, you want to kind of sit there and say, hey, uh, this is where there's going to be a loss of energy because I'm hitting the wall and I'm taking into account the refract, you know, the, uh, the friction of the wall, the restitution of the ball, uh, the friction of the ball itself, the gravity that we're hitting, and all, this other, all these other factors that you can play into it by creating a, um, a velocity factor, which we're going to get into in a second. So what well, we're doing here in this particular this first case where it's a dead on hit is we're just reversing the velocity. And so if it's coming in this particular case, if you look at the diagram, this one here, it's coming along the X axis. It's hit, it hits an obstacle or a wall that's immovable, a static object. And then it's just being reflected back in the same in the opposite vector. Right. And it's good to think about this as a vector because you have a vector, you have a magnitude and direction. And all you're doing is reversing the, the velocity vector to the other side. And then you're going to get it bouncing nicely. This is a very simple case, but we need to talk about it because we build all the other cases on this one. Okay, so that's um, that's repositioning. And here's some example of that code, right? So we got a bit of pseudocode here where the ball hits the wall. So again, we're checking. We're saying if my x coordinate of the ball is greater than the x coordinate of the wall in this particular case, because the way it's positioned it's to, towards the right, if the ball, if the wall was towards the left, it would be a different scenario, a different chart, right? Minus the ball radius. Why is that? Because the ball radius is, is the half the width of the ball. We talked about that last time, uh, a circle uh, detection, you know, the, the difference between uh, uh, the distance between the radius uh, and the actual object itself is the, is the check we're making. So circle to a line or circle to a wall, whatever it's gonna be, here's the check. So that's your detection. And then we say, well, then my ball, the X coordinate of the ball is equal to the X coordinate of the wall minus the ball radius. We're going to move it back out to the, to the radius of the ball. So it's just touching the wall. And so all we're doing is reversing it back to where it came from. Okay. And notice that also in this particular case, again, the pseudocode guys. So don't, this is, there's no ball that has any kind of, in this particular, this ball instance, this ball object might have a VX velocity across the X axis. This is what this is showing. And you might have a VY, velocity across the Y axis, as a property. Here, all we're doing is reversing that, so we're making it go back the other way, right? So we're, we're uh, saying that the ball velocity across the X axis is equal to ball velocity uh, across the X axis times minus one, which reverses it and goes the other way. So a couple of things to consider when we're doing this kind of stuff. Uh, we need to do this closing detection. We need to reposition the particle at the point of collision. We always have to do this, and you're gonna see this every single case, right? if you want it done right. And then you have to calculate the particle's new velocity just after the collision. And that's based on, do we carry the momentum? Do we have energy? Are we, are we, how are we doing that? Questions so far around this simple case? Reflection point first and then velocity calculation? I would definitely say that, yeah, because that's why, that's why we're repositioning the ball back to where it's supposed to be. Now we're also gonna base the reflection point, not on the, the, the position, the point of touch, in this particular case, but remember that all our objects right now are being positioned by the, right, whatever that center of the object is, right? So if the center is the, uh, you know, the focal point, if you will, the registration point of the object, okay? And in most 2D games, it's the middle of the object. Or you can also call it the center of mass for those 3D objects. This you also work in 3D. But what if you have this idea where you have a scenario where you have a bounce, it's going to go instead of the angle of incidence being a perpendicular uh, angle to the wall or the obstacle, you have an angle like this where it's not perpendicular. It's actually some obtuse angle or something like that, right? What do you do then? And this is where we get, you know, kind of a little bit more complex. Well, the thing is, you know you're going to reflect it back on, depending on how you want to do the reflection, there's two types of motions here. There's motion that's perpendicular, 
so in the normal, which is what the x-axis is in this particular case, into this vertical wall. From a vertical wall perspective, x would be a perpendicular axis to this vertical object, right? And then there's something parallel. Parallel would be tangential to the actual wall itself. To two, so there's two components again. We break this down into both the v velocity on the x-axis and velocity on the y-axis. And all we want to do is reverse the perpendicular, but not, not the, um, the tangential, right? So what that, what that means is that I wouldn't reverse the angle of incidence so it goes back this way. That doesn't make any sense. We would definitely change the direction on the x-axis, but not on the y-axis. The y-axis direction would remain the same. Why? Because if we did that, it would go back this way, which is unnatural. Here, we're reversing the x-axis by keeping it going up across the uh, y-axis in the up direction. Uh, in, this, in this case, it would be the negative y, because typically in most coordinate systems that we see in a 2D game, you'd have the 0, 0 point in the top left corner of your game, right? So it's going in the negative y direction. We would keep it going in the negative y because it's going that way already. It's not going to stop until it hits another obstacle. And then you'd reflect it on the negative y, again, perpendicular to the object, back the other way, and do not reflect the, um, uh, the x-axis. You keep the x-axis going in the same direction. All right, so that's how the, the uh, you know, angles that are not perpendicular would work. You'd have both uh, components working. Okay, again, we're building this up to see what it would be done, right? Now, one thing to note is you'd keep it going, but if there's energy loss, then you'd have to account for that again. When on bounce, notice that this has penetrated the wall here, and you'd have to bring it back from here to this somewhere back in this position over here when it's not quite penetrated the wall for you to do the bounce. You don't want to bounce it from this position because this position, you've got a problem. You've got a visual artifact that's going to happen here because it's inside the wall already. Okay. All right. So, again, this idea of decomposing or decoupling, it's not like the conscious uncoupling of, you know, with Paltrow or anything like that. It's like, you know, literally uncoupling the, the, the uh, X and Y coordinates um, from the, the object and then taking those two, uh, you know, components and making sure that they are uh, adjusted according to the initial vector or the direction of the object that's moving. All right, so we talked, we talked about this here. I just, I kind of, uh, I kind of talked about this in, in terms of uh, what you have to do, okay? Um, and then that's in, a, in in elastic, in a case of an elastic collision, it's fine. But when you have inelastic collision, the original little uh, op, um, example I give you doesn't work, you have to do something like this. So this would be the elastic way. This is what you would see in your code. But in the, then you'd have to do something like this instead. Instead of multiplying by negative one, you're gonna multiply by some factor. And that's going to be your inelastic factor, where it's going to be some value between 0 and 1, but not quite 1. So if it's less than 1, let's say, for example, 0.9, that means you have some kind of loss of energy, 10% loss of energy every time it strikes a, a, an object. So it's going to get 10% slower, 10% slower, 10% slower until it stops, right? Um, if you want to go crazy, you can make that a little higher, which means it'll have a, the ball would have a lower restitution, maybe, some less bounciness. The, ball, the wall might be more... There might be more friction on the wall, different kind of, uh, of surface. There might be gravity, which you can take into account afterwards, uh, and all those kind of things as well. And so you could factor that into this idea of a negative V factor, whatever that would be, right? So very simple code, but that's one way to do it. Now, this is simplistic, but what you could do, this negative V factor, you can compute. So let's say, as an example, you wouldn't just put a random number like a 0 to 0.8. Let's say you actually had some kind of function that would calculate or compute what the exact, um, you know, V factor is going to be on the X axis and Y axis based on all these other things that we talked about, right? Then you'd have a more realistic movement and response. That's what's going to happen. Okay. Um, and, and this is just showing you what happens when, uh, when you hit the wall. So now this is interesting in this vertical or, uh, you know, wall example, energy loss on the x-axis would, you know, kind of equate to energy loss on bouncing. So that's the restitution piece that I talked about, the, the bounciness of the ball, right? If there's loss on, on x because the ball is going to bounce back. 
you were to reverse it, if it hit the, the horizontal, then it would be on the Y axis, right? Um, but here, when it comes to this one, uh, you know, energy loss on the Y, that's traveling up as an example. So it bounces off the wall and keeps going. That's friction on the wall. The wall actually grabs the ball. That's what's really happening, right? And how does friction work? Remember that there is a intermingling between atoms, right? That's what's really happening. Um, you know, one object is rubbing against another object and some of the atoms uh, kind of start to play with the other atoms from the other uh, and molecules from the other uh, object. That's what's really happening. They kind of intertwine, if you will. They do this dance, right? And it, if one object has more quote unquote friction, they play more, one object plays more with the other object when I say play, I mean like literally intermingles, it slows things down and there's energy loss because the object is transferring energy to the wall, right? Where there's this excitement and usually the excitement is in the form of heat, right? Um, if you ever, I don't know, slid across a carpet like this, get carpet burns, that, that's friction, right? I mean, you're, the carpet is trying to connect with your pants, with your body, whatever. And what's happening is an intermingling. There's, a, there's the atoms and molecules are playing with each other. And this causes this play or dance, if you will, causes heat to, to occur. And that heat is the energy loss. That's where the energy is going. The energy, of course, is neither created or destroyed. It's transferred or, or uh, converted into some other form. Okay, so that's really this idea, this, this example here. All right, so... Uh, very basic examples, elastic and inelastic collisions. You can use those for most games that are kind of shooters or if you have some kind of arena or something like that. I think about a projectile hitting a wall or something like that. Um, one thing we didn't talk about in the PowerPoint, but I will talk about with you before I go on to bouncing off inclined walls, is the idea that there's a perfectly inelastic or completely inelastic collision. And what would be that? What would happen there if there's an inelastic collision, completely inelastic? So perfectly elastic and then completely inelastic. What's the difference between the two? How about someone like a Hercules who's done physics before? What would you say is a perfectly or a completely inelastic collision? What happens? Perfectly inelastic, huh? Perfectly inelastic. Yeah, the object would stop. So there would be no bounce. That's perfectly inelastic. So there's no elasticity. So if I fired a, I don't know, if I threw a ball at a wall, it would just stop which is, and maybe if there's gravity, it would drop, right? That's it. That would, that, and it's happened before. If you ever get a wet ball, like a wet tennis ball or some kind of, you know, ball that has a leak, you know, one of those kind of things, throw it against the wall. And maybe it even wobbles when it hits, you know, when it, when it flows and it hits the, the wall and just drops. All right. That's almost a perfectly inelastic example. Um, the other object that make it perfectly inelastic is suppose that you know, uh, something that the material that's striking the wall instead of a ball, like let's say a car, uh, it absorbs, the car absorbs part of it because of Newton's third law, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? We transfer energy back into the car and the car crunches up, right? So it creates almost this inelastic effect where it doesn't bounce, it just stops at the wall, it crunches up, right? Inelastic. Um, kind of. For us, it's inelastic they're, enough. They're designed, uh, they're designed right? Yeah, and, and the engine also goes down, not towards you, right? Because if it goes towards you, it'll kind of pierce you, kill you, right? Um, and then your cars are right up. But what happens when you when you bounce off incline walls? So one thing we talked about was, you know, you have these walls that are perfectly aligned with the X and Y coordinates of the plane. And by the way, this these examples can always be extended to three dimensions because you could have, a, you know, some kind of X, um, Y, and Z. The X, Y, and Z planes, you have some kind of obstacle. As long as they're aligned with the world, you got no problem. World space, if it's aligned with world space, you're good to go. But what if it's not? What if it's a some obtuse angle, some, you know, Euler angle or, you know, uh, God forbid, a quaternion uh, in three-dimensional space, you know, then it becomes way more complex. Why is that? Because you have to do some rotations. We'll talk about that. So here's an example. One... Um, way of thinking about this is, you know, you want to think about, well, what if I adjusted my coordinate system so that it, it just seems that it's not an incline. And we talked about that actually in some of our examples and we had that incline, you know, some kind of object that kind of falls down an incline. And you guys did that in assignment number 
two, right? Where you had that object that fell down the, you know, uh, the loot box, right? That kind of slid down the, uh, the ramp or whatever. That idea um, is like this. We can change the coordinate system so that it isn't X and Y. It's on the, on the incline, right? And once you've done that, it makes your calculations easier. But let's assume we don't do that. What can we do? What other options do we have? Well, one thing to note, um, there's two conditions. Uh, the perpendicular distance of the particle from the wall must be smaller than its radius. That's the one thing. Okay, so you know that, you know, it's not inside the wall. You're talking about something that the, the, the perpendicular, which means on the normal, whatever the normal is to the plane, you want to be able to make that check. The other thing is that the particle must be located between the endpoints of the wall. So you need to be able to detect that too. If it's not on the horizontal and vertical, you need to kind of know where these are. And over here and this end over here, you need to know that because what if that wall, what if there's other stuff and you can miss the wall and kind of keep going down this way or down this way, right? So we have to check to see that the particle or whatever the object is hitting is between here and here, right? We have to make that check, right? Can't assume just because it's there, it's gonna hit. And this is based on, by the way, a line or a plane we're not using the collision detection we talked about last week where we talked about aabb collision type or uh, separate axis theorem or something like that you could also use that way, form of collision detection okay we're going to talk about something else because it's going to kind of lead to our collision response here's the example now i want you to take a look here because it looks complex but actually what they're doing is they're using vector math uh to do kind of the similar thing right where we can you know kind of detect collision based on vector math okay so what are we doing well, we know that if I want to find this length, the vector uh, over here, we can kind of say that this vector A, B, right, is a result of P1 minus, or uh, yeah, P1 or minus P2, right? There's P1 and P2, and we have these two vectors from the origin. If we, if we, if we project a vector from the origin, right, uh, from the origin to B, or in from the origin to A, as an example, we have two vectors. And if we do simple subtraction or, or addition, depending on what you think of how you think about it, you can get this no other vector between A and B. That's the difference between the two, right? Because you're going to get that A, you know, you get almost like this, uh, um, you're using Pythagorean theorem here, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, right? Um, so that's, what we're, that's how we can get that. But there's other relationships that you can find as well. For example, you can project this vector B1, which is from this position of the ball, of the ball P to A. You can also project uh, a vector from P to B, right? So one end to the other. And once you have all these vectors, just a bunch of vectors that I'm that is drawn here, it looks complex, but all I'm doing is drawing vectors from the position, the middle point, two different places, from the origin to the middle point. That's the, the position, the vector position of the actual object. From the origin to the end of the, of the from the origin to the beginning of the wall, and so on. Um, you know, and then another vector from the position of the ball, whatever that is, to the, um, the closest, uh, I would say, towards the wall, the perpendicular towards the wall. is right. There's another vector. And that's the distance away at every current time slice from from the wall, the, the, the object that it's going to hit. Okay, that's what these these things are, right? Once you have these relationships and you have this idea of, you know, and notice that they're all, they've all been marked with numbers, you can do some funny vector math that does some of the calculations for you instead of, especially when it comes to some kind of circular sphere relative to a plane, which is what we're talking about here. This different kind of collision. Okay, that's what this all means. And so we know that if the distance is less than the radius, we have a collision. We know that. And distance, going back up to the little diagram, is this, this D, distance, the distance between the, the position of the ball and the wall, right? If you know that this distance, the total distance, is less than the radius, that means the ball is inside the wall, just like we talked about before. Same kind of uh, circle detection, circle de uh, collision detection we talked about last time, or sphere collision detection. Okay, and this idea of the length, if both, you know, we, we can project B1 and B2, uh, you know, QA and QB, we can project them to, um, you know, their projections of vectors B1 and B2, 
right in the direction of the wall. So if we look back at the wall itself, here's the wall, and you can see that here is B1. The, the B1 vector is from, um, as an example, from P to A and from P to B. We just called it B1 and B2, right? These two vectors. And um, this uh, QA and QB, all they are is projections. So I'm taking this, this vector right here and then projecting it down so, so it's on the same direction as the wall, right? Again, all I'm doing is defining segment, line segments right now with vectors, okay? Nothing to panic about. It's just, hey, we're looking at stuff and going, hey, what, can I, what kind of relationships can I make with the wall and the ball, okay? And once you've got all those kinds of things, then you can start thinking about equations. Well, I can say that the width, you know, of the actual object is P1, P2 minus P1, the width of the wall. How do I know that? If I go back to the diagram, right? The width, right, is, you know, P1 minus P2. We're using um, vector subtraction. That's the, this line here, how, how, what this magnitude is. That's what we're looking at. Of course, someone's got a call. Um, you know, that's, that's what that is. And um, P, P2 minus P1. And the other one is we can also define B1 and B2, right? We can say that B1 is P1 minus P, and B2 is P2 minus P, P being the position of the ball. Okay, all we're doing is, again, we're just defining the vectors and how we're doing them. How, how do we get those, how are we getting those lines in the first place, right? And we're making it based on simple things we know. We know the origin zero, zero. We know what the position of the ball is in terms of X and Y coordinate. The lengths, the lengths of the ends of each of the of the wall segment, whatever that wall segment is, we would know that, right? And now we can make other vectors inside of that a diagram. So why? Why do we care about doing all that stuff? Because you can create relationships, right? Um, and once you create relationships, you can know that you know the ball to the wall distance, you know, as an example, would be a certain length. You know, ball to wall one, um, as an example, is the the vectors that you're projecting and you can actually calculate the projection based on some methods maybe that you've defined or you use a, a, a math library to, to you know kind of define them for you where you say well uh you know the wall and you know uh, p1 as an example uh, i want to subtract the ball in position the whatever the ball position is from that to create my projection that's what that is so I'm getting the numbers that I talked about here by simple, some simple uh, functionality. And then once I have that, I can calculate the distance, uh, the distance with D uh, from you know, the ball to the wall, whatever that distance is, right? And once I have the distance between the ball and the wall, we're beautiful, right? Because I have, it's like, uh, you know, I can calculate the distance. When I know the distance between the ball and the wall, I can detect it. I can say, hey, if the distance is less than again, the, uh, the, the radius, then I have a collision. And that's a, we have to talk about that collision detection differently than if we had, as an example, um, some kind of rectangle. I'm, I'm, I'm not using the other collision detection systems from last week, this way. So, and I'm showing you a different way of doing it now. All right, so great. Once we have that, then we also know, um, once we have the distance, we also know the, uh, the direction because we have a vector. Once we have vectors, I can reverse the vectors. I have an angle of incidence, I have a vector. I can just create the inverse vector, a negative vector. And now I have, I can do the exact same thing we talked about last time, which was it doesn't matter which coordinate system you're using, what angle the wall is based on. Now you can bounce it you know, in the negative direction depending on uh, the components of velocity that you're talking about uh, based on this system. And it's a little bit easier when you have a wall that you're hitting. Now it's hard to see, but there are some code examples I think I gave you, uh, which we'll talk about later. The other thing you need to do, of course, we cannot forget, and even in the incline example, the repositioning part, right? So when the ball, when the wall is inclined, right, and you're not hitting a coordinate system, so it's not parallel to the x or y coordinates, you have some kind of obstacle, it's not like that, it's some other angle, or x, y, and z, let's say, because this can also work on the z plane then what you have to do is reposition the ball if it penetrates the wall based on the angle of incidence, like I talked about before. And you need to know that, you need to figure this out. And there's some interesting things you can figure out here by uh, doing some simple calculations.
showing you this so you can see that this is not a, a good scenario. You don't want the ball to penetrate the wall again. You want to push this back based on this vector. And it, when we use vector math, that's why vector math is so important in games. I know some of you say that, well, my vector class was good, linear algebra, but I forgot a lot of it. Or you didn't, you know, you don't know quaternions or whatever. It's okay. Um, but you need to kind of uh, get into it. Truly, if you're in game dev at all, you need to kind of embrace math and you have to do math pretty much every semester. That's the right thing to do. Okay. And I mean, whether you're doing it or not, you should practice it. You should look at it. You should be, I mean, if you're into it, um, you can write it down too if, you're, if you don't do it very often. But math should be a regular thing for you because we're using it. It's, it's, a, it's I mean, it's a tool we use uh, in our toolbox to make uh, life a little easier. Otherwise, we have to make more complex calculations and our performance is, is uh, um, you know, kind of compromised. All right. So, yeah, we, once we know the direction, we can reverse the direction. We want to push the ball out so that it's repositioned uh, back to where it, uh, it struck the wall. And we can figure that out by based on how far. Uh, so, again, the change in displacement, this is what this is is the radius plus the distance uh, dot n, uh, where n is the normal, uh, the unit vector uh, perpendicular to the wall. That's the normal. And unit vector means it's one unit away, whatever that is. Uh, in unity, that would be a unity unit. In blender, that would be a blender unit. In um, you know, some kind of uh, game, it might be pixels. You know, whatever the unit would be, one pixel away, right? Uh, in the direction that you're, uh, that's perpendicular to the object. That's what you're doing there. Over the sign of the angle. And that's the, you know, the, the change in um, displacement, which is what we're talking about here. So you want to take that, whatever that change of displacement is, you want to move it back to that amount. And so that way you don't have this uh, wall penetration thing happen. And here is some example of some pseudocode that you could possibly think of. I've got some, whatever, I'm going to calculate the displacement. And what I do is I use another function that basically detects you know, kind of passes in uh, the change in, uh, in displacement in here. And then it kind of de declares this displacement amount, whatever that displacement is. And then what I do is I reposition the particle based on the displacement by, by subtracting the position of the particle from the, from the displacement that I pass in. So for example, let's say I have an amount of displacement of 10 pixels. I've traveled into the wall of 10 pixels. I want to move back out in the angle of incidence, whatever the angle that I'm going into the wall, back out. 10 pixels so that I start my, my reflection from there. Okay, that's what's happening. Okay, um, so that's this part. And we can calculate the new velocity based on um, the X and Y components that are going into the wall. And now, if we think about this conservation of motion, if we have a, an amount of motion in in, in a scenario like a game, we know what the velocity is going to be, right? We already know the velocity. However, if we had some kind of energy, like if instead of velocity, I had some kind of energy number, then you could sit there and say, well, I have some kinetic energy, Ke is equal to one half mv squared. In fact, right? Right now we have balls or objects that are massless, particles that have no mass, right? But if you wanted to bring mass into effect, you could do that as well. You could sit there and say, well, I have, I have a mass of an object. It's very massive. It's going to be pulled down to gravity. It's going to be pulled to an object. It's going to strike an object. Maybe it's going to impart uh, some kind of momentum, a moment, or some kind of impact that's going to have to the wall, maybe move the wall back based on the amount of energy that it's going to absorb. Right? And then I do that again outside the scope of this course a little bit is I calculate how much energy I'm hitting the wall with based on how far the object has traveled fire a bullet at a wall and I want to move the wall or break a door down or something, I have some kind of, you know, energy that I'm transferring in that, in that motion, right? Based on the muzzle velocity of the object, whatever, hit the wall. And then that wall absorbs part of that energy based on the factor that I talked about earlier. And that absorption, if the wall is not static, right? Let's say as an example, it can be blown up or moved or something that is not hundred percent static. It's just heavy. So instead of having a static object like a wall, I'm hitting a heavier object. I can still move the heavier object with a very high velocity object because of momentum. If you look at the superhero, the flash, um, I know this is a really weird example, but anyone not know the superhero flash, right? 
Well, if you don't know what he is, let's just talk about him for, for a second. He is a speedster, right? And he's not very big. You know, pictured in the comic books as really muscular or huge or anything like that. But the Flash, and it, there's some physics involved behind what they did. If he hits somebody really, really fast. Now, he also has a high healing factor. So when he hits somebody, he doesn't get hurt too much, right? Otherwise, he would hurt too. Having a really, really fast speed and he hits something, he'll squash like a bug, right? Uh, but he doesn't squash like a bug because he's a superhero and he can take the hit, right? But if imagine the Flash, not very strong. He's not even trained in fighting. But if he hits someone with his punch, if he's traveling at a very high speed, what's happening is his velocity is the increase in velocity based on his mass is, incre is increasing the amount of energy that he's transferring in that the momentum that he's transferring because he's increasing his speed is causing another a more energy to be transferred. That's how he's so powerful. And he can take other... Uh, stronger people out because he's very, very fast. And that speed translates into energy. So at the same time, if you think about that, it's like that for bullets. If I take a strong, um, a, you know, a kind of a big caliber rifle or something, and I, uh, you know, I fire it at the door, you know, depending on if, what kind of material the door has. And if, if, cause it's not static, a door actually would move, right? Uh, or even against the wall, there's going to be some penetration. I'm going to basically penetrate through the wall, break the wall down or whatever. It's going to absorb some of that energy, but it's going to, uh, it's going to deform. In games, that doesn't happen. You ever notice like most uh, first-person shooters, you don't blow anything up? Not really. You send a particle called an impact. That's what it is. It's a trick. And the particle, which is an impact, just hangs on the wall. And so it looks like the wall's been hurt. But there's wall is nothing hurt. Just... There's a particle, there's an actual texture that's just hanging on, on this wall now forever because you fired bullets against the wall. That's how it handles it. Because it's very complex to start crumbling a wall with particle effects. It's not easy for you to fire bullets. And really, in effect, when you're doing a first-person shooter, you're not firing bullets anyway, right? What you're really doing is projecting some kind of ray, and you're calculating where you're going to hit with the ray, and then you're creating an impact, making a sound, and then you have, you have a hole. It looks like a hole, but it's not real of this is fallout you know the whole uh you know fallout games or anything like that or even um games like uh, uh destiny you can see an impact so it's a particle system that basically colors the wall looks like you've hit it uh skyrim is a good example you fire some kind of fire bolt it you know you have a particle effect and then it goes away right or you have some kind of frost effect and it looks like there's a frost mark on the wall that's that is an impact that is just a particle or a texture and that's the way they handle it. So they, it looks to me, it looks that like you've hit the wall or hurt the wall. But there really isn't any kind of effect, you know, of that. Now, I'm digressing a little bit, but only because I want you, some people ask, what if I want to have a destructible environment? What do I do? How do I do that? How do I handle that when it comes to physics? Um, the answer is it's very complex, but there's some tricks you can use, right? Um, one of the tricks you can use is swap out the, the model, right? That's a trick. So I have a waddle model of a wall. It's perfectly, it's perfect. I fire a bunch of bullets at it. And when there's enough damage, I swap out the, the, the model into something else. And I might do that. I might have several, you know, versions of the model. One that's, you know, 80% damage, 70% damage, 6% damage, 50% damage. And then I swap it. I keep swapping it out until it's fully damaged and there's nothing there, right? The challenge with that is you have to have something behind that, you know, so if the, if the, if the person goes in there, or maybe it's a collapse wall, so you still can't go through it, there's still the collider there to stop you, but it looks like you've, it's a collapse, it's a, you know, kind of destructible environment, right? Kind of, you know, creates a neat game uh, effect, uh, but has no real physics value. Here, what we're talking about, though, is, hey, what do we do? How do I change the angle, um, you know, when I, when I hit the wall? Again, first I reposition, and then what I want to do is I want to... Um, you know, send the object back along the path that it came from. I reflect. That's what I'm really doing. Okay. Um, and really what we want to find is this, this two components, the normal velocity and then tangential velocity, which is parallel uh, to the actual plane, whatever that plane is. So uh, the velocity that's, you know, perpendicular to the plane and tangential, and you want to kind of uh, calculate those two things. And once you have you add those, you modify the particle's position based on the normal tangent, whatever that is. 
Okay. And just to do that, I've included a little bit of code, just to give you an example of uh, if I have this check bounce, so I have a wall, and then this example is a ball bouncing off an inclined wall. How do I do that? Um, so I declare a couple of variables here. Again, this is pseudocode. You can use this in JavaScript or Java or whatever. With a little bit of modifications, you can use it anywhere, right? At the end of the day, it's the same thing. Um, I declare some kind of a temporary direction, whatever the wall direction is. Uh, you know, that's the one thing I do. I calculate these things I talked about, you know, that complicated diagram that I showed you earlier with all the vectors. Here's the particle, here's all these vectors. And I do this, by the way, this check bounce is every frame I'm doing this, right? So it updates every frame I'm doing this, these, all these calculations. I'm, I'm, I'm setting up all these variables, calculating where the ball is going to be, all these other vectors, and every frame I'm getting closer and closer to the wall. Do I have a collision? Do I have a collision? Do I have a collision? Oh, I have a collision. I have the angle of incidence. I reflect the, the, you know, the ball in the opposite direction. I reset the ball's position. That's what I want to do, right? And then I reflect. I kind of, uh, I, I set the, the ball or the object in motion in the, in the other direction. Very simple, right? But the code is here if you want to look at it. Um, the other, some of the methods that are defined here, para, um, as an example, they describe later on. Um, it's actually in this PowerPoint. It tells you what it does. But for the most part, you can see what this is doing. So again, collision at the wall boundaries, what happens, uh, and what, what does it do? And that's something of a mystery too. What happens when, if the wall, I'm going to put it up to, to this thing. Uh, let's get another clearer picture here, another object. So there's, there's, there's a scenario here. What happens if the ball is hitting on the corner of the wall? What do you do there, right? And there's another scenario. That's another case, right? Because now, which side did you hit first? Did you hit this side of the wall or did you hit this side of the wall? If there's some kind of side here, which one did you hit first? And you have to make code to determine that, right? Is it one or the other? And sometimes it's random. You randomize it. You sit there and go like, okay, uh, mo if it hits directly on the, um, if you're hitting directly on the actual point of the wall, uh, then what you're doing is on that, that point of impact, you're reflecting it the other way, the other direction. Okay. So we've got some example of code. Um, let's talk briefly about particles in 1D. Now, what the hell does this mean, 1D? It means that they're very simple particle collisions. In the book that I took this example from, which is a neat book, um, you still have to do the same things. I have to do collision detection. So did I collide? Did I not collide? I still do need to do particle repositioning. I need to do that because I want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, it, it looks right. And when I say particles in 1D, imagine now you don't have a wall anymore. You have two moving particles, two moving objects that are going to hit each other, right? Um, and now you're doing collision detection between the, the both objects are detecting collisions with each other, okay? You still need to do repositioning because they're going to penetrate, right? Every frame, what's happening is every time slice, am I close enough? Am I close enough? Am I close enough? Wait, well, yeah, I'm inside each other. What am I going to do now? I got to push myself back to that initial point of contact, right? That particular frame, and then start reflecting in the other directions, okay? That's if the objects are going towards each other. And there's the other scenario where the objects are going in the same direction, okay? Maybe one object moving quicker than the other one. All right, so we have this case where we have to do repositioning. We have to calculate the new velocity just after the collision, just like normal. So these are the same things. We can use Pythagorean theorem or the whole idea of, like last week, we talked about this idea of uh, uh, collision detection using spheres or circles. Maybe the same kind of scenario in this particular case that we're talking about. And when we have two objects, notice that um, you have these two objects with a vector that's going in the same direction. You have uh, a vector u1 and another vector u2. That is the angle. And they're going uh, directly. Notice that the centers are aligned, right? The centers are aligned, and they're directly impacting each other. They're going right at each other's center, right? They're not off center. That's a different type of collision. That's another case, right? This one is where these two objects are just hitting each other dead on, like a head-on collision, okay, with two, the, two, these two objects, right? So what's going to happen is they're going to go the opposite way, but you need to position them again out so they're not, they're not crossing over each other exactly where they should be positioned because of the bounce, right? And then you reflect them back in the opposite direction, just like you normally would, right, with, uh, with the wall scenario. And now they're both going to travel. Not the, in, in the wall case, only the ball would travel, but the wall would stay, you know, kind of static, right? What about energy transfer? What about mass? What about all that stuff? 
this is where it becomes a little bit tricky. And what you can do is if one object is more massive than the other, right? If they're equal mass, then they're going to both bounce off each other. Like example, cue balls or, or cool. balls. Boom. They're going to bounce off each other, right? What if one mass is greater than the other one? Then what's going to happen is the mass, it's not going to stop the reflection or there might be less reflection or more energy loss uh, from the small ball. The small ball is going to travel the other way, right? Really quickly. And the bigger ball is still going to travel in the same direction. It's not going to be pushed back, uh, you know, all the way, but it's going to slow down. That's what's going to happen. Because why? Because I'm still transferring energy back to the other ball. There's still Newton's third law, which is reaction. I have some kind of energy transferring back to the original. But this, this is the simplest case where both objects are equal mass hitting each other dead on. <laughs> what do you do? Right? Simple. We know what to do. We've done it before with the wall. We're just moving both objects this time instead of just one. Okay. Um, and they talk about uh, S1 and S2 as being the displacement. And what you want to do for repositioning is calculate the um, this idea L, the overlap distance right between the two. And what you want to do is you want to move them back L amount. So if I say that I've overlapped my first ball X amount of pixels and my second ball or my object, my particle, this many pixels, and I add those two up, then I'm going to move them back that total amount of pixels uh, so that they're not uh, hitting each other anymore. And they also define U1 and U2 as the velocities of the respective particles just before po collision. And we can find the displacement by the total displacement being uh, velocity times time. Back from physics, right? When we did uh, displacement D, uh, not distance, right? And so we define this S1 and S2 as the original velocity multiplied by the time slice, however many frames, as an example, is equal equal to this, uh, you know, displacement for each of the particles. How much did I displace uh, my, my first particle based on the, its speed? How much did I displace the second particle based on its speed? And by the way, this is assuming that they're both equal mass. So what's going to happen is, and this is a perfectly elastic collision. There's no loss, right? If you want to start talking about inelastic collisions, you have to add a factor in there. So it becomes, there's even more energy loss when they come back away from each other. And there would be. Noise. That's energy loss. You know, when I hit a ball against another ball in, on, in pool, it makes noise. Clack. That clacking sound. Remember how sound works. Sound excites the atoms, right, inside on the, in the air. That's what sound works, right? Sound travels through a medium as a particle in a wave, right? Studying the, the molecules in the air, that's how sound works, right? I'm actually, that's where the energy is going. The energy is going as a sound, right? At the same time, I'm also, that clacking sound, Right. What's happening is the balls, we can't see these cue ball or the, the pool balls hitting each other. Right. But what's happening is they're actually compressing and decompressing, just like a spring. This idea of this hooks, the idea of Hooke's law, where a pool ball isn't perfectly solid. It looks solid. But when they hit each other, there's a bit of bounce. Right. And that bounce, that restitution, what we talked about, what we, how we, we talk about it, is a thing that makes the pool ball uh, go the other direction. And that restitution, that amount of bounciness, also absorbs energy, and so there's it's not perfectly elastic. If it was perfectly elastic, the pool balls would keep bouncing forever, right? And they just keep on hitting each other. Boom, 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 boom. And they would never stop. Now, the other reason why they're not perfectly elastic is because of gravity, because the gravity is pulling them down, and there's a bit of friction on the pool table, right? So that little bit of friction, the gravity and everything else, the weight of the pool balls and so on, a mass of the pool balls is slowing it down enough so they don't the, the uh, movement of the pool balls don't last forever. Okay, um, and so what we can do is we can create these relationships between displacement and initial speed for both uh, the first particle and the second particle. Uh, again, think about the one, uh, the coefficient here, uh, one as an example. This little subscript, subscript, S one U one is equal to the S one is the displacement. <laughs> of particle one and you want is the initial velocity of particle one, right? And you can say that uh, the ratio of displacement from one particle to the other is equal to the initial, the ratio of velocities from one particle to the other, right? That's what it is. It's equivalent. And once I have that, then you can make another, this, this equation right here where you create these uh, to figure out what the total displacement is for each particle. You can uh, relate them in terms of these two equations. Once you have the equations, you can make a method for that. 
right? And then now I have how much I'm going to displace each particle back along uh, so I can reposition. This is all for particle repositioning, by the way. When I'm repositioning a particle back to where it went, because it penetrated the other particle. All right, and that's one case. How about this case? This is the second case, which is more complex, slightly more complex, right? Notice that the U1 and U2 are traveling in the same direction, but maybe they have different speeds, right? So I have two objects, right? And they're, uh, they're being hit. So object one and object two, these two particles, they hit each other. And what, I end up ha what ends up happening is they go uh, in the same direction, they're still going in the same direction because one is traveling maybe faster than the other one. Now you're gonna have a little bit of um, energy being transferred back and it's gonna be proportional to the amount of velocity that this first particle has and its mass. Again, going with the whole idea of conservation of energy. However massive this particle is, right? This the bigger particle, if you will, or the faster particle, it's either gonna continue moving this way or bounce back the other way. Okay, if I have, more mass, it's going to keep moving this way. If I have less mass than the particle that it hits, it's going to bounce back. If I have equal mass, both of them are going to bounce, right? But they're still going to move in the same direction. Now, again, this is a case where both particles are completely aligned behind each other. We're not off at all. We're not talking about some kind of weird, you know, glancing blow. This is a direct hit, okay, kind of thing. And again, these are very simple scenarios. So how do we deal with a glancing blow? And that's the next one. And that's where they talk about this idea of 2D motion, okay? Or 2D, uh, uh, collision with, in 2D. It's not really a collision in 2D, but what we do is, and there's, they don't talk about it too much in the book, but what they do say is this, well, yes, we're kind of glancing. We're not hitting it dead on, right? I might hit a, an object and I'm not hitting center to center. I might be slightly off center. So what do I do, right? Well, I calculate how much off center I am and then I assume that the center is from that particular point, and then I reflect from there, like as if it's a surface, uh, uh, some kind of plane, right? So whatever the point of, of, of uh, impact is, I move, I reposition the particle just like normal. I do all the same tricks that I do with regular particles. I Once I reposition everything where they're supposed to be, I find the point of impact. Once I know the point of impact, that is the place that it's going to um, you know, reflect from, as opposed to uh, dead center. So it's not that complex, but when it comes to handling uh, this particular case, uh, it's something that happens more often than the dead center. You know, hitting one particle, you know, dead on the other particle almost never happens. Even in pool, how often you hit exactly, you know, the ball. And, and a lot of times you don't want to. You want to be able to glance a hit off one pool ball so it goes in a particular direction, right? Um, so in this particular case, you can do that, but you have to move it. You have to move wherever the center is that it, that it was and assuming that the center is over here now. Right, as if there was some kind of um, you know uh, surface over here, and then you find the direction of the hit based on where the particle is, right? And you reflect from there. So they give you some um, again the same kind of pattern, the same um, uh, process, if you will, uh, which is what we're talking about here. So again, here are the process for all collisions we talked about last week and this week. This week we talked about a little bit of collision response, right? One, detect the collision. <laughs> Make sure you can detect it. And we talked about different ways of doing it last week and some new ways this week, right? And two, split the collision and the, the velocities into different components, X and Y, right? And then once we have that and determine whether they're normal, at, at a normal, uh, to, the, to the plane that you're hitting, uh, plane, the object, whatever it's gonna be, is it uh, you know, the normal, the perpendicular? and the tangential components, whatever those two components are, right? Find those two things out. It may not be exactly X and Y. It could be other values of X and Y, some kind of ratio of X and Y for both those two components, right? Then make sure you reposition the particles. One of the key things is to make a, um, you know, a collision response look authentic and realistic as much as possible is repositioning the particles back out so you have the proper reflection. Again, angle of incidence has to make sense with angle of reflection. And then um, once you have that, you calculate the new normal velocities just after collision, uh, because collision, that's the, the, the new collisions you're gonna do. So you've, you've done, you've repositioned, you have the situation before the collision, situation after the collision, and this is all based on the, um, 
uh, you know, the physics that you want to bring into play. Okay, now um, I've included again some code example in the back, which is here's your check collision. And this check collision function is going to trigger every frame. So every frame you're going to be checking collision. It's going to um, two different particles and they're different than a wall and a particle, right? Because the wall is stationary or mm -hmm. static. And this, these are two dynamic objects moving, uh, you know, kind of what happens when they, when they hit. And you can see it's some of the same stuff uh, that we've seen before in terms of pseudocode. This is one part of it and there's another part. So in summary, all right, uh, when we talk about uh, collision response more than anything else, we can make it very simple. We talked about uh, perfectly elastic collisions where you don't lose any energy, right? And in some games, that's perfectly fine, right? Or somewhat inelastic collisions where you do lose a little bit of energy because you don't want your particles lasting forever. You want them to lose speed or lose momentum, if you will, after they've hit a couple of uh, the wall a couple of times. Um, a lot of times we handle this by giving it a range or a lifetime. I have a, a projectile, some kind of gun, and I'm hitting a wall, and maybe it's going to bounce. But even if it has momentum to carry it off into five different walls, it's going to die or disappear after a certain point in time. Tricks, because we don't care about these other particles typically, unless you're playing some kind of weird game where you want to bounce a bullet off of five walls to hit some object, like a puzzle game or something. Uh, but most of the time, we don't care, right? And, um, you know, so that's the first thing. So what happens when you hit the lifetime of the particle or bullet, if there is something like that, if you're hitting, if you're, we're talking about projectile, like bullet firing, uh, the tunneling effect we talked about before, because if you have a very small object, it's difficult to detect, uh, you know, uh, a collision. Very small, very fast, difficult to detect. So what Corey said earlier was, I should always calculate ahead with a bullet. How far am I... Am I hitting, am I going to hit next frame? Am I going to hit next frame? If I'm going to pass through next frame or be on the other side of the wall, then that's negative. I got to start, I got to, I got to take action. I got to do something different this next frame than I normally do, right? I'm going to do a different kind of calculation. I got to start thinking about repositioning my bullet so it reflects, or maybe it's going to be just an impact, right? So it just absorbs because bullets don't really reflect a lot of times unless it's uh, some kind of really, um, strong material like bullets on metal as a good example but if it's bullets on a bag of sand like the example from our test right uh then it's going to be absorbed into the bag of sand and we don't care about it <laughs> we just we just know it's going to go in if we want to know if it penetrates and goes out the other side that's a whole other thing and that's that's a physics uh issue so we talked about this we talked about elastic and inelastic collisions right most of the, the times it looks way neater way cooler when we have in, inelastic collisions because we have some energy loss, looks more realistic. But with more realism comes more complex computations. That's one. And we talked about these four scenarios, right? Because let's, let's face it, most of the time, you're gonna have these four types of scenarios uh, and others very similar to this, where you can build upon them, right? You can use these scenarios as building blocks, right? To create more complex collision response. So example would be bouncing off a horizontal to a vertical wall. We have that scenario, right? Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're bouncing off a vertical or horizontal wall as a particle or as a big object. Like example, I have a spaceship and I'm flying and I'm going to hit a wall. How do I detect collisions? Remember when I, what we talked about last week, we're going to envelop the spaceship in some kind of primitive shape. What primitive shape am I going to use to detect collisions? How do I detect collisions? And after I've gone and done that, I've got this, uh, you know, kind of a, a border if you will, uh, around the wall, a boundary. Once I've got that around the, or, or uh, sorry, around the, uh, my spaceship, I can then uh, proceed to reflecting it just like, as if it's a particle, okay? And again, basing off its uh, current course and speed. So that's vertical and horizontal walls, incline walls we talked about, and these two scenarios. We didn't really talk in detail around particles in 2D, the way they talk about it in the book. Uh, we talk about more of, is it a head-on collision or a glancing blow? And if it's a head-on collision, it's easy to take care of, especially when it's 100% a, 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 a elastic. When it's a glancing blow, we reposition, we in our mind, we reset the, the, uh, um, the angle that we're glancing off of. To, we're accommodating for that angle. And then what we're doing is from there, we're doing the exact same stuff. We're using the exact same <laughs> methods we developed for the 1D simple head-on collision with the glancing blow by repositioning the 
uh, the center, uh, almost like a phantom center. So pretty simple stuff. Now this is stuff we've talked about in this course. And this is the wrap up for today. Um, is fundamental understanding of uh, physics for games, right? That's what we talked about. Um, you're going to take this further. If you're continuing with game development, you're going to take it further and you're going to do maybe some physics with game engines. One thing to note when you use things like built-in physics engines like Unity um, and the stuff that's built in for uh, Unreal and other physics engines out there is this idea of, um, you know, how they use these same formulas we talked about, uh, you know, to create this natural motion. Okay, that's what it is. If you want to, sometimes you may have to do it on your own. Maybe you won't have access to a physics engine or it's too, it's overkill to use a physics engine for your game. You're making a, um, a very simple 2D game and you don't want to use a physics engine. Um, so you don't. And you use some basic physics knowledge to do it yourself. But collision response and collision detection, especially collision detection, I would say more than collision response, um, you know, is, is I would say uh, essential in terms of your knowledge, right? So I want to leave you with that thought. Any questions around collision response? Because that's what we talked about mostly today. All right, so pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I'm going to share both these PowerPoints with you on Blackboard. Um, and that's it for us. Uh, some of you I will see next semester uh, in a regular semester. With some, well, more of a regular semester. Still going to be a little bit shorter than normal. Um, but we will get back into shape. Any questions for me at all? All right, that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much for coming out today. I really do appreciate it. Uh, you guys were my audience today. I didn't expect too much more than this. Um, and I will see you next semester.